Hi everyone, it is the first book review of 2019 and I'm really excited to share this book with you. This book will be something that you can use throughout the year in order to achieve your goals. And the book we are going to be reviewing is No Excuses, The Power of Self-Discipline. 21 Ways to Achieve Lasting Happiness and Success by Brian Tracy. Oh, so this book was published in 2010, and I'm going to read to you a little snippet in the back about Brian Tracy. It says, Brian Tracy's extensive worldwide personal studies in business, sales, management, marketing, and economics enabled him to move up to become the head of a $265 million company before he turned his attention to consulting, training, and personal development. He speaks to corporate and public audiences, including the executives and staff of many of America's largest corporations. He has written more than 40 best-selling books on business and personal success. So yes, I have had this book for years and I did not even know I owned this book. It was at my mother's house and when I went to one of my two or one of my two bookshelves at her home, I saw this book. I gravitated towards it because it had the red no. So he's screaming, no excuses. And it kind of reminded me of Wayne Dyer who had um, a book about no excuses or something of that nature. And another reason is because it is about self-discipline. And that is my favorite topic to read about. I love reading books that help me to improve my life, whether it's my finances, my health, my relationships, my physical appearance, everything. I love to naturally enhance my life. Brian Tracy, I didn't remember who he was until I went on YouTube and I realized that I had actually seen one of his videos a few years ago and that I really liked it. I feel like he is the Wayne Dyer of maybe a finance, the business world because of the amount of books that he's written. This book was very interesting because it wasn't quite new thought, but it wasn't quite all professional. So for example, when I say it wasn't quite new thought, it wasn't like creating money with the law of attraction or the power but it wasn't quite all professional like finance. It was not like get a financial life or smart, was it smart women finish rich? It was a nice balance between both worlds. And I didn't really know what side he was on. I'm like, okay, is he religious? Is he, is he like new age? Like, what is he? He just balanced it. He's just a balanced person. As I was reading this book, a lot of things resonated with me. Some other things, I'm like, this is kind of outdated, but this book was written in 2010. He was in another type of business world. I haven't read his most recent work, so we shall see. This book is divided up into three parts, three sections, and it is made of 21 chapters. There are seven chapters for each section. So the first part, part one, is self-discipline and personal success. That one is my favorite part because I, I understand it better. Um, I can apply it even more quickly than the other chapters or the other sections. He talks about success character, goals, personal excellence, courage, persistence, and responsibility. All very good virtues to have. I'm glad that he put this part first because if you can master these qualities, you will be successful in any aspect of your life, whether it is in the business of finance, the business of art, or anything, any type of thing, a relationship, if you have these qualities and you put them into use, you will open doors that could be closed to you. 
despite the amount of money that you have. There are people in this world who are financially stable, who have all of the wealth in the world, and nobody wants to work with them because of the type of characteristics they are possessing at this current moment. They're not trying to be them, their best selves. That's why they're losing relationships, friends, opportunities because of their attitude. Hmm. But yeah, that is my, that's my favorite section. The next part of the book that he discusses is self-discipline in business, sales, and finances. This is a section where I agreed with him on some things and other things I didn't quite agree with him on, mostly because they seemed outdated to me. But as I said, this book was written in 2010. It was a different business world. It's similar, but it's a different business world. He's more focused on people that are in a company, like a regular nine to five type of job, sales jobs, stuff like that, where you're in a corporation, you know, kind of the, uh, what is it? You know, corporate world, corporate world, 80s, 90s, 60s, all that stuff. But we are in a different type of world right now. It's similar, but it's kind of a different type of business world because you have people working from home. They're not even working around people. You know, they're working from home. There's people that have no office. They don't even work at home. They just travel everywhere working on their laptop. They don't have any type of coworkers. They don't even have to see their clients face to face. They don't even have to talk to people on the phone or through email. They just do their work behind a screen. But his main focus are the ones that are in sales and the ones that are climbing a corporate ladder. So if you are in that type of situation, I feel that you would be able to maybe connect with this book even more than I did. Other parts that he didn't mention, which he's not really going to mention because the whole book is no excuses. So find a solution to this issue any way that you can. Um, he talks about various obstacles and how to overcome them in the business world. You know, he didn't mention something like, let's say, racism, sexism. Well, maybe you mentioned sexism, but I don't see anything like racism. I mean, you can be a very excellent employee, an excellent professional, and be doing all of the right things and trying to reach the top. But there's this glass wall or ceiling that they talk about, or you're dealing with racism because your boss doesn't like you, or your coworkers don't like you, or you're getting harassed by your coworkers, or they're making sexual advances at you. Of course, he didn't really mention that in this book because he's trying to stay positive, you know, trying to get you to concentrate on the things that are within your control. I have been in both situations as far as racism and um, sexual harassment at work. I remember I worked in a courthouse and that was funny because it was a double whammy. I was sexually harassed at the courthouse and I was also um, discriminated against at the courthouse. One of my coworkers would sexually harass me. He would follow me. He would make threats to me. He tried to whisper things in my ear and I wanted to tell my boss, but my boss was racist and he obviously didn't care because I overheard him talking about us. There was like a chunk of us that were black. So I overheard him talking about us. So I'm like, what's the point? I can't tell him, he doesn't care. And I remember one day we were outside in the parking lot and somebody said that we were breaking into cars when we were just sweeping with a broom. So I'm just like, okay, whatever. That was, yeah, I'm not even going to mention what part of town that was in. But I'm sure if you look at my other videos, you'll know which part of town that I do not go to. There was also another job where I was doing everything right. 
I had a degree, I had a bachelor's degree, and all it required was a high school diploma. I would go after interview after interview for this position. It had basic clerical work. It was in a company that I worked for. And they'd be like, no, no, no. I'm like, what? What? I don't get it. I'm qualified. Why? What? You're getting all these strangers from outside. Yeah, you won't move me up. Like, what is? What is the deal with that? So when they did move me up, it was like three, four years later. Even though I was doing a lot of things that could have moved me up in a year. So obstacles like that, he doesn't really get into in this book. I'm like, maybe he knows about it. I mean, he is a white guy, so maybe he just didn't experience it. It is not a part of his personal experience, and we write what we know. But maybe he just wanted to stay on a positive note and give you advice over things you can control. You cannot control if somebody is racist because that is their own personal decision. I can't go in and clean sweep your heart and be like, look, stop being racist. Stop doing that. Stop harassing me. I can't do that. That is their personal choice. I can only operate in a way where I can affect whatever's going on to the best of my ability. But yeah, I, I like it. There's one part of the book where he mentions that if you are a salesperson, you aren't working unless you're on the phone, which is so true. I was a telemarketer for, ooh, <laughs> I don't know. I was a telemarketer for a month. I almost forgot about that. I was a telemarketer for a month and everybody else would not work. They would just lollygag around. They would take a cigarette break every 10 minutes and I would just be sitting at my desk trying to get people to send money for the what I don't know what we were raising money for like the the orchestra or something and I'd just be sitting there doing my work and nobody else would be doing it they weren't working they were lollygagging so he says if you're at work work if you are at work work I feel like that if you are at work and you don't want to work, that is not the place for you to be. If you consistently don't want to work, don't want to even put out the energy to work at your job or whatever, that is not the right career field or job for you. You are doing a disservice not only to the company, but to yourself. Don't do this to yourself. If you stay stuck in a position that you hate, you are going to not only affect your peace of mind, you are going to affect your physical body. You are going to affect your relationships because you're angry. Some of us cannot just up and leave our jobs because we have a family to support, you know, we have bills to pay. So you have to make an action plan in order to get out of that position always have some type of action plan even if it's saving one dollar a month one dollar a week a hundred dollars here and there save it until you're able to pay off enough where you'll be okay and be able to just walk away from that job and do what you want to do sometimes you might even have to go back to school just make the sacrifices that you have to make in order to be a happy individual he also talks about problem solving in this chapter and he mentions that when you have an issue, when you have a problem, it is not one dimensional. He gives you a, a list of things to ask when there is a problem. It'd be like, okay, is this the only problem? What else? What else? You have to get more information when there is an issue in order to solve the issue effectively. You also have to solve issues while they are small or else they can snowball and just end in disaster. Like, <laughs> that's what happened to me. At one job, I kept being late. I kept being late because... I had relocated, I had been robbed, and that moved me to a different part of town. I didn't have, I couldn't make it to work on time. 
because I was further away from work. Nothing was making a connection. I should have changed my route early on when it started being an initial problem. And then that affected my job. It became a very big problem due to that small little incident that happened of my break -in. So yes, when you have a problem, get it while it is small before it screws you over. Get it while it's still small. And not just for your job, for your relationship, for your money. Get it while it's still small. The last part of this book is self-discipline and the good life. He talks about happiness, personal health, physical fitness, marriage, children, friendship, peace of mind. My two favorite, maybe it was three, um, my three favorites out of this chapter, out of this part section was personal health, marriage, and children. The personal health, I took that, I guess, personally, because there was a time period about two years ago where I was very sick. I was bedridden for about a month and I couldn't do anything. I wasn't effective. Because of that, that physical issue, it created more physical issues. I started getting my teeth broken. My teeth started to break. And I was in pain and just crying and on medicine and I could not achieve anything due to this physical pain and all of these ailments. So that that issue caused me to focus on my, my personal health. I started drinking tea. So even though I'm still physically exhausted from that sickness about two years ago, I am more productive than I was the year that I was sick. If you are not feeling physically well, it is difficult to get anything done. You know, how can you run a business if you're just limping everywhere and feeling pain in your joints and just want to sleep all of the time? You're not going to be effective. How can you run a successful business if you have terrible eating habits, you're poisoning your body, and you can't, you don't have the energy to run your own corporation. You have to treat yourself as good as you treat your own business. If you want your business to be successful, you have to be physically successful yourself, you know? Some people are like, I like the way I am. I don't, I don't want to be at my physical greatest. Like, look, you need to live a long life. I don't want you to die. I mean... I don't want you to die of something that could have been prevented, you know? So if you take care of your health, you'll be working your whole life. Look at Bob Proctor. He's still working. He is still working. He's in his 80s, still working. Les Brown, doing push-ups every day. He's in, what is his 60s, late 60s, 70s? That's not old, but a lot of people in their 60s and 70s having joint problems can barely walk can barely remember because they're suffering like from dementia, schizophrenia, different things. You know, you have to take care of yourself. And I'm not just speaking to you. I'm speaking to me. Don't overwork yourself so hard where you don't get any rest. Don't overwork yourself so hard where you are starting to physically affect your body from stress. Don't do that. If a job is giving you physical ailments, if a job is bringing toxicity into your body, if a relationship is bringing toxicity to your health, you got to let that go. Either let it go or find a way where you can deal with it in a healthy manner. But personal health is so important. It is so important. Like, don't, don't, don't play with that stuff. <sighs> the next one is marriage, which I I like because I feel that marriage is another form of self-discipline. It's one of the greatest forms of self-discipline. It's easy to just go out and date people and jump around and do all that stuff. But it is more challenging to love one person in multiple ways because the person you marry they might have core elements that will stay the same, but overall, they're going to change. They're going to mature. They're going to become a different person. 
you might not have children with them now, but after you have children, then your marriage will change as well. It teaches you how to love. It teaches you how to be committed. And that is why I really liked that chapter. <clears throat> I've been in relationships where I would give my, like, all in my relationships, you know. It never ended in marriage. I guess because guys were less like, I don't like you or they were too young. But I would dedicate myself, commit myself to this relationship. And some people have a difficult time doing that. If you are a person who has a difficult time committing to a marriage, then you have to tell the people that you are dating, especially if they are marriage oriented. If you want to just go around, date around, that's okay. Some people are meant to be married. Not all of us are meant to have like one person in our lives. Some people want to have like Oh, I want to be a polygamist or something like that. I don't know. I, that's not my lifestyle. I'm more monogamous. Okay. I don't want to share anybody. But if you're going to have a successful relationship or partnership, you have to bring commitment. You have to bring understanding. You have to bring maturity and willing to change for the better. If both parties are enhancing themselves, developing themselves, the marriage will be long lasting, you know, because you're both operating at your highest point. He says that it's another half, like you're completing each other. He kind of mentions that. I feel like to have a successful marriage, you should already be complete in yourself. And the person should also be complete in themselves. And you can form something new. And the last part is... Um, self-discipline and children. I mentioned in my other videos my work with children. I worked with children for 13 years. I don't have any children of my own yet. I do want a family and my work with children has really helped me to operate in a certain manner in this life because children watch everything that you do. They will mimic everything that you do. If you curse around children, they will pick that up and they'll just start throwing some F-bombs and all sorts of stuff. If you are a person that has bad habits, your children will also pick up on those things. They'll pick up on your eating habits. They'll pick up on the way that you speak, how you dress. They will pick up on everything. So if your children are going to pick up on something, let them pick up self-discipline. This is one value that will help them throughout their entire lives. You have a responsibility to create a human being that is excellent, caring, and in addition to society. You don't want to have a child that, because you didn't teach them the qualities that they needed in life, just wandering aimlessly through life, you know? Sometimes a person becomes self-disciplined because their parents were not self-disciplined. I know my mother, she raised me. She raised me to the best of my ability, or her ability, <laughs> the best of her ability. My father, he was somewhere in town. I mean, God bless his soul, but he was doing his own thing. He wasn't practicing self-discipline. My aim in life is to get even further than both of my parents. Because my father had a problem with addiction, I do not do anything that could get me addicted to anything. So I don't drink. I've never smoked cigarettes, never smoked weed. I don't like go out, just do toxic habits. So if you have a child and you are doing toxic things and you're wondering why your child is acting out, then take an evaluation of yourself. Take an evaluation of what are you doing. A lot of people think that children just want to have fun, 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 fun all of the time. But children crave for self-discipline. They crave for structure. They don't like things being all over the place. They don't like moving from here to here to there and being hungry. They don't like that stuff. It shouldn't be the child's position to take care of you. 
They are a child. That is not their responsibility. They shouldn't have to worry like, where are you at night? Like if you're not at work, where are you? I don't know where mommy and daddy are. I don't know where grandma is or, or if you're a guardian or something. When you operate your life in self-discipline, your children will become people of self-discipline, especially if you just every single day drill it into their mind. Gently. Don't be like an authoritarian, what was it? Authoritarian parent. Don't be like that. Have some balance. Be understanding. See what their talents are. So yeah, I really liked this book. I think I'm going to use it throughout the year. Because at the end of each chapter, he has actions that you can do. And he also has a lot of good quotes in there. Like one action is to name three people living or dead who you most admire and describe one quality of each of them that you respect. So I may do a video about this book, the, um, the book Spearmint. To see what would happen if I follow all of Brian Tracy's advice of having no excuses. But yeah, this book has been very popular. Even when I'm out and about, when I was out and about reading this, people would stop and be like, what is that? Because this red no, no excuses, it hits you to the core. When it's no excuses, that means you got to get rid of your blame game. You got to get rid of the toxic things you have held on. For years and years and years, you've got to get rid of your old self. You have to let that go. You can't have any excuse to block you from your success. So thank you all for watching this video. Look up Brian Tracy. He is on YouTube. He is a very excellent speaker. And I think you would learn a lot from him. So bye-bye.